This video is part of a webinar series on Hindu Dvesha, an educational series to explore and expose systemic Hindu phobia. Hindu Dvesha is a, like systemic racism, is an ambient, all encompassing discourse that denigrates and delegitimizes Hinduism and the Hindu people even as it relentlessly problematizes, dehumanizes, and demonizes them. Its accu accusatory rhetoric treats Hindus as objects or patients to be examined and diagnosed. It presupposes and concludes that something about the Hindus and Hinduism is irredeemably bad and wrong, evil, and demonic. Now, the colonial roots of Hindu Dvesha, if you look at what happened, you know, and, and Honestly, uh, Hinduism has been through three phases of colonialism. The first phase is the Islamic colonialism, which is very, very rampant for a long time in India. And then came the British colonialism. And after independence, it's, we could say, we safely say we've been through a secular colonialism as well. So what happened? Well, there was a colonizer and the colonized. The British clearly were the colonizer and India was colonized. If you look at it in terms of the Marxist dyad, the exploiter and the exploited, clearly the British were the ex exploiters and the Indians were exploited. How were they exploited? Well, the British extracted some $45 trillion in current day valuation over a 200 year period from India. But how did it generate Hindu Dvesha? Well, two things happened. If you look at the Islamic, they did simply destroyed a lot of things. Islam destroyed the universities, colleges, monasteries, temples, centers of learning. And the British, they built up by constructing, through creating universities, colleges, schools. And of course, they created a whole history and a narrative about the Hindus. So one was, you know, destroy, destroying through destruction, the other was destroying through construction. Either way, they result in a kind of Hindu Dvesha. Now, we're going to zero in on one figure today. There's a gentleman by the name James Mill. Okay, very important. Uh, it's an example. Now, he wrote a book called The History of British India and published it in the year 1817. And that's nearly 200 years ago. So here's a, a quotation from this book. Whenever indeed we seek to ascertain the definite and precise ideas of the Hindus in religion, the subject eludes our grasp. All is loose, vague, wavering, obscure and inconsistent. And their wild fictions seem rather the place and whimsies of monkeys in human shape than the serious asseverations of a being who dignifies himself with the name of Rational. Okay, it's one quotation. Here's another one. The offspring of a wild and ungoverned imagination. They mark the state of a rude and credulous people. This people indeed are perfectly destitute of historical records. Here's another one. No people, how rude and ignorant soever, who have been so far advanced as to leave us memorials of their thoughts and writing, have ever drawn a more gross and disgusting picture of the universe than what is presented in the writings of the Hindus. And there's one more. So here, uh, this is not a quotation per se, but I just collected some adjectives that he uses in his book to describe the Hindus. So Hindus are, according to James Mill, you know, all of these things, imperfect, barbaric, savage, wild, vague, wavering, obscure, rude, primitive, regressive, frivolous, wretched, Imbecile, mean, absurd, base, gross, monstrous, superstitious, stupid, degraded, hierarchical. So, you know, I mean, there may seem like a lot of adjectives, but I, I uh, you, know, I, you know, trust me when I say every single one of them can be found in this book, The History of British India, republished in 1817. Okay, so now I want to introduce to you Dr. Kundan Singh. Is one of the core doctoral faculty at the University. 
This video is part of a webinar series on Hindu Dvesha, an educational series to explore and expose systemic Hindu phobia. So James Mill came up with this book, History of British India in 1817. And when I assess that book objectively, I consider, consider it nothing short of hate literature. James Mill was born in 1773 uh, in Scotland. So James Mill basically sent to University of Edinburgh, uh, where he did his master's in divinity. He decided to come to London in 1802. For the next four years, he spent his time as a journalist writing for different journals and newspapers, uh, <clears throat> making a living. Somehow in 1806, he tumbled upon the idea of writing history of British India. And this book took 12 years. It was a roaring success, which endeared him to the board of directors of East India Company. And in May 1819, James Mill was hired as an officer in East India Company. So he rose up the ranks very, very quickly. James Mill exerted a massive influence on the policies and uh, policies of India and the history of British India basically became the primary book for making structural changes in governance and rule of India. This book became the required reading for English civil servants. Ronald Indon in Imagining India calls this text as a hegemonic text. And why does he call it a hegemonic text? Because there are different ways in which Hindus are described as rude, savage, barbaric, uncouth, and so on and so forth. One of the primary modes in which the description was, was made was that Hindus are hierarchical and oppressive. And Hindus have been hierarchical and oppressive right from the very beginning. He gives significant space to describing Hindus as women oppressors. Because of the position that James Mill acquired in East India Company, he was able to induce organizational and structural changes in India, which deformed the Indian social system in a very, very big way. His research was picked up by Hegel. Hegel influenced Marx. So the writings and contentions of James Mill traveled through Hegel to Marx. So this entire left, left narrative, which is operational in academia at this point in time, you know, basically regurgitates what James Mill wrote 200 years ago. And that is the reason when you look at the textbooks for children in the United States, you will see that the entire narrative on Hinduism revolves around this particular equation. Hinduism equals caste system, equals hierarchy, equals oppression. Now in 1825, James Mill and the group with which he was working decided to put together University of London. Now through University of London also incorporated the thoughts of James Mill, which included his thoughts in history of British India. Later, Oxford University Press and Cambridge University Press came with their own editions of history of British India. And when you compare these books with what uh, James Mill produced, you will see that the plan that James Mill had put in place is actually getting replicated in these publications. 1850s onwards, institutions and universities began to get 
established in India. And history of British India and other publications from Oxford University Press and Cambridge University Press began to find traction in the curriculum which was meant for Indians. And that is how the narrative which James Mill had put in place began to actually get internalized, replicated, and reproduced. In fact, Kalyan Vishwanathan has done uh, some research. He analyzed Jawaharlal Nehru's history of, uh, sorry, Discovery of India. And there are many passages in Discovery of India which are exact replications of what you find in history of British India. And after 1970s, the left historians or the Marxist historians, they took over the Indian intellectual scene. And all these forces, you know, basically began to combine. And that is why both in India as well as in the United States, what you find in contemporary times is replication of the same discourse which had been put together by James Mill long time ago. Of course, you know, this narrative has been sanitized. It has been made politically correct. But all the characteristics that were used to define Hindus as savages and, bar and, 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 and barbarians, they remain in place. And that is why, you know, children growing up in this country get badly affected by the discourse which gets introduced to them from sixth grade onwards. And what does this narrative do to them? It produces inferiority complex, it produces shame, and it produces guilt. And that is why it becomes extremely important that we critically examine this text and enumerate the various ways in which the replication of this discourse continues in contemporary times. In fact, after having researched this field for close to two decades now, I can safely say that whenever you will find a Hindu dveshik content in academia or media, you will be able to find its connection with the writings of James Moore. And that is why Hindus at this point in time need to read those seven chapters that have been written by James Mill. And what we call in academic parlance, start deconstructing the Hindu Dveshik discourse in the light of narrative put forth by James Mill. This video is part of a webinar series on Hindu Dvesha, an educational series to explore and expose systemic Hindu phobia. I'm here to just present, uh, you know, our thoughts on the psychological impact of uh, Hindu Dvesha and in the context of the post-colonial experience uh, that. Uh, uh, we have had. I'd like to start with this quote that I have uh, just put up on the uh, screen. Ames Azair is a Francophone scholar of Caribbean descent. You know, he makes a very telling remark in his uh, in his book Discourse on Colonialism. He says it's a prelude to disaster and a forerunner of catastrophe. You know, that's basically what happened to India, Indians, and Hindus. It's kind of reflected in our state of mind. And I want to explore that in the context of uh, Hindu Dvesha. See, a colonized mind, you know, it's a conditioned mind, you know, it's uh, caught in a vicious cycle, you know, it suffers from inferiority complex. It carries a very, very low self-esteem. And most importantly, it lives on borrowed cosmology. I'm going to give you some examples, run through some points here. Uh, we have developed self-hatred and self-doubt and ignorance of our own religious and traditions. You know, it kind of impacts us pretty much on a daily, you know, day-to-day -day basis. We don't realize it. We are extremely defensive about our own traditions, especially when it comes to caste or women's rights. When those two are brought into the discourse, we actually become very defensive here in the US. You know, see, Kamala Harris became a VP only today when women in position of power 
is not new to India, Hindus or Indians, you know, but we don't seem to be articulating that point very well, actually. That's one. Second one is we look for validation from the West always. Uh, I do know, I think many of us would have heard of two recent instances when, uh, when Tamil and Kannada chair were set up in some of these universities here in the US. I think one was in Harvard, another was in Columbia, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm not wrong. We have outsourced our interpretation to outsiders because we don't know about us ourselves, actually. That's the second point I want to make. We are extremely defenseless, you know, defenseless against pernicious attacks on our religions. You know, there are several Christian TV channels. I'm sure we have all seen that before. Uh, they have their ulterior motives. They were at the forefront of distorting, demonizing and denigrating our Hindu culture. We have remained silent for way too long, actually, because we don't know what to respond what to respond and how to respond. Another interesting one is, you know, many of us would have seen, and you know, many of, I have actually seen, I have this experience, many Indians, when they come over to the US, they develop fake accents. In fact, they have more accent than grammar. In fact, you know, I don't know what is the necessity to develop a fake accent. They're not confident of their own language, grammar, so on and so forth. They do that actually. That's as a result of inferiority complex. There is always a compulsion, right, to assimilate with words. I'm not saying everybody does it, but a lot of them, actually, you know, they suffer from inferiority complex. They can exhibit some of these uh, characteristics. With such a mind, right, a mind, you know, we only develop low self-esteem. There's a lack of self-confidence, you know. If at work, I'm sure we all have that experience where we have seen our own co-workers or Indians who lack that self-esteem, self-confidence, they're not able to articulate themselves properly, even in their day-to-day -day lives. Okay? Because of this, well, we begin to live on borrowed cosmology. Right? Our worldview and worldview about us is always on Eurocentric framework. You know, uh, Our interpretations, the interpretations of Hindu society using is always using alien context, terms such as left, right, center, nationalism, or even secularism for that matter. They don't apply to us, actually. There are a lot more powerful components within our own framework. We are not able to articulate it. Our tradition is extremely diverse and very pluralistic, you know. But the current discourse in the mainstream media here in the U.S. and in the social media is very Eurocentric. It drowns pluralism, which is embodied in our culture. We are not able to articulate that better because we don't, we don't or we have not examined some of these things very critically. So we rely on borrowed cosmology. We are extremely defenseless against fear-mongering over nationalism. Nationalism, sure, yes, in the European context has had a negative connotation. But in the Indian context, it's rooted in independence movement. We have a very superficial view of it, actually. We have not critically examined these so that we could articulate our Indic viewpoint much better. We have not done that. So we continue to rely on borrowed cosmology. Even just uh, recently, last year, there were a lot of CAA protests that played out. They were all based on alien framework, European framework, right? Secularism, nationalism, fear-mongering over all of it. Continues to, you know, uh, the Western media continues to employ these frameworks. And the borrowed cosmology is used to interpret India. As long as it does, I think it will continue to remain the same. You know, there are many such examples I think I can give that shows the subservient nature of a Hindu mind. A colonized mind is a conditioned mind. It's doctored, I think, from its cardinal basis, right? This mind interprets India from a colonial perspective. It's oblivious of its ancient uh, traditions and is extremely defenseless against offense to our own primordial identity. You know, we are actually ambassadors of our own civilization. You know, The damage, the psychological damage inflicted upon us has turned us into very bad ambassadors, I think, you know. We need to effect a change, I think, in that regard. Just to review what I had said, the impact has been very debilitating. And I want to just close my remarks by saying we suffer from inferiority complex, we carry a very low self-esteem, we live on borrowed cosmology, and we need to effect a change. This video is part of a webinar series on Hindu Dvesha, an educational series to explore and expose systemic Hindu phobia.
used Hindu dvesha in different forms. My experiences of it growing up have been different from what I've experienced as an adult. Um, today, I'd like to share three of those experiences that I've had as an adult. So situation one, where I experienced uh, Hindu hate, occurred with someone I had considered a friend. Prior to this incident, she and I had had a lot of great conversations, one of which centered around our mutual love for singing. Uh, she at one point during our conversations even mentioned that, saying that she was a born-again Christian, which I did not have any issue with because I thought she was simply providing her background. Um, and in the same vein, I had mentioned to her that I'm an American Hindu. However, her dvesha was made very clear to me the day that she told me that it was her duty as a friend to convert me. Uh, prior to this declaration of hers, she had come to my desk to invite me to accompany her to her church. And at that moment, I still didn't think anything of it because in my mind, we were friends and implied in friendship is mutual respect and liking for a person based on who they are. Plus, I had gone to church before with other friends, um, but they also accompanied me. I made sure that they accompanied me to my, uh, you know, temple, mandir, cultural events. And these friends have also been genuinely interested in learning about Hinduism. Anyway, this particular individual then started to tell me that it was her duty as a friend to share the light with me, that light being Jesus. She told me that she follows a religion that is 100%, and I'll never forget this. She stated she follows a religion that is 100% and told me, while you may believe you are following God, your religion is 99%. And we all know 99%, she told me, we, we all know 99%. 99% belongs to Satan. Now I was stunned. I felt shock at first because, you know, it was a comment that came out of the blue uh, and we had never talked about this before. Um, and she never had struck me as a harsher judgmental person. But of course, what she said to me, I felt very judged. I also felt anger at the proselytization efforts. And then during that exchange, I immediately realized I was dealing with a very ignorant and religiously arrogant person. Uh, so that was, that was, uh, so I, of course I ended the, the quote friendship. The second situation I experienced Hindu Dvesha at work was in the university setting. So the irony here is that higher education is looked upon, at least in theory anyway, as being a bastion of open ideas and learning. The department where I had worked, a supervisor who identified as, as a very strong Christian, never let a day go by without showing the staff that she's better than everyone because she found God. During one particular Christmas season, she and another staff member who, even though she was married to a person from a different faith, they expected me to help decorate a tree that was brought into the office, telling me that I needed to get into the Christmas spirit. Mind you, in our office at the time, all of us, the staff were comprised of people of all different faiths. Plus my colleagues, including my supervisor, knew that I am Hindu. So I was shocked when she said this to me. My supervisor also, she didn't ask or expect my Muslim American colleagues to participate in decorating the, the tree. I refused to help decorate the tree and I went into my office to start my work day. Um, my supervisor became visibly upset and she stopped speaking to me for a while. The supervisor associated decorating the tree with worshiping Christ and never stopped talking uh, about how her church would continuously give money to the poor Hindus in India. So, you know, I was very bothered by that incident. Um, and even though I wanted to tell her off, she was my boss. So I felt very trapped. The last example I wanted to share was what I experienced from a social perspective. Um, I used to socialize with a large group of individuals from a variety of backgrounds, ethnicities, religions, you name it, who, by the way, can all boast highly educated highly educated backgrounds, one even being a university professor. This large group of friends were comprised of individuals, uh, you know, as I said, from different religions, but folks at this, this particular gathering happened to be majority uh, Muslim friends, Muslim American friends. One day at one of their homes, we were having a discussion about something or another, but the conversation quickly turned to religion. So my so-called friends started questioning me about my Hindu beliefs based on what they thought 
Hinduism is about. So there was already a built-in condescension in their questioning. They kept asking me while laughing, so why do you all worship cows? What is the point of having a red dot? What good does that do? And they kept saying, you're a heathen. Um, they were not interested in hearing my responses to their questions. Um, I definitely stood my ground as I was getting over the shock of being verbally attacked. Of course, I responded back because I always saw myself as coming from a place of being equals with who I thought were friends. So I was very shocked. And I did say, I'm paraphrasing, you know, I do remember saying, you know, guys, this won't be an intelligent conversation because you are operating, you are all operating from a place of ignorance. I can name off basic tenets and historical information about your faith, but from the way all of you are speaking to me, you have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, the portrayals of Hindus by James Mill continue to be championed today in the mainstream media. Over the last couple of years, you know, Hindu Dwesha and the media has escalated. There have been and continue to be numerous anti-Hindu news and opinion articles in all the mainstream media outlets. And as a Hindu American, I was deeply offended and upset by these what I call frivolous, unethical and biased articles. Most of these pieces were filled with baseless exaggerations about India and Hindu culture. Um, they also contained bigoted or racist statements about Hindus and belittled and demeaned things that are sacred to us. So I, I, I'm just going to quickly highlight a particular article which I view as one of the most egregious examples of Hindu Dvesha. So um, the Atlantic magazine published an article titled Modi's Kashmir Decision in the, late, uh, the Latest Step in Undoing Nehru's Vision on August 5, 2019. This article was written by um, an individual, <clears throat> individual named Krishna Dev Kalamur, who is now the deputy Washington editor for NPR. In this article, Mr. Kalamur insinuated that the BJP governments and hundreds and the hundreds of millions of Indian citizens who voted for them are overwhelmed with fanciful ideas and obsessed with drinking cow urine to maintain good health. This wild and baseless exaggeration, which was um, supported by flimsy evidence, is also a slight against all Hindu Americans who have a favorable disposition towards the BJP or India's current prime minister. So I, I read many such articles and tried to respond with well-crafted letters to the editor, calling out factual inaccuracies, misrepresentations, and bigotry, but not one of them was published. You know, I, I tried to bring these articles to the attention of other Hindu Americans and ask them to respond with letters of their own. And you know, many members of the community were either indifferent or willing to accept some of these articles, uh, some the validity of some of these articles. So um, reading these anti-Hindu articles and not having any recourse and the witnessing the community's apathy caused me a great deal of trauma. And you know, as, as a result, I no longer read many mainstream publications. I also stopped using Facebook and quit most WhatsApp discussion groups. Growing up in America, disrespect of foreign civilizations is baked into the education system at all levels. Starting in elementary school, I was taught a history built on white supremacism. We learned all about Columbus sailing west across the Atlantic in three tiny ships to trade with Indians, but we got pablum on how the Christian, Catholic, capitalist, settler colonizers used manifest destiny to expand their dominion while the Indian was eradicated from their new world. But in elementary school, we're taught Indians helped the pilgrims at Thanksgiving. In reality, it was 300 years of near genocide against the indigenous people of this land, the American Indians. The public education system facilitates the erasure of real history and the conflation of the Hindu and Indian identities. We weren't even given a hint of the hundreds of millions of Hindus who were murdered, captured, enslaved in order to create the Mughal Empire, right? We don't even learn about that at all. In middle school, 
it is not just the bias history, but the accumulating microaggressions in popular culture where we only had Apu at the 7-Eleven with a hard accent to the continued bullying of Hindu youth to this day, we're only scratching the surface. We're going from Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492 to Columbus sold nine-year-old Indian girls into sexual slavery. It is written in his own words, in his journals. And Mahmud of Ghazni is very much like Christopher Columbus in that he documented his barbarity against Hindus in his own words, in his own journals. Yet they try to portray us as the patriarchal beast. The colonial roots of Hindu Dvesha goes deep in the education system. In high school, the first advanced placement course I took was European history. It is no accident or lie that winners write the history, but they also project their narrative. I didn't get a real understanding of Bharat or Hindu history until recently, thanks to independent reading and because of the Hindu University of America. And in academic spaces, we are ridiculed for using Bharat while the Caliphate, the Mughal Empire, Zion, Mecca, Aslan, Khalistan, Zhongguo, other civilizations celebrate and are allowed to celebrate, encouraged to celebrate the names they give their aspirational selves and societies. In college, there is no Hindu history, but there are some South Asian studies. There's definitely Jewish studies and Muslim studies and hundreds of Christian universities, Catholic colleges, divinity programs, you name it. When I was at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA and CSUN, Cal State Northridge, I was not aware of the Hindu Students Council. It existed, but I was not aware of it. But I was aware of the Muslim Students Association and the dozens of Christian clubs. Having gone through the American public education system, I know we need a Hindu University of America. I know Hindu Dvesha exists and has been cultivated in the public education system, not just in America, but all over Europe, all around the world, including in India with our first education minister, right? Abdul Kalam Azad. White Christian America had a general disrespect for other cultures and civilizations, but many have stood up and gained stature through civil rights movement, through protests, through myriads of tactics and strategies. But we as Hindus haven't stood up yet. We haven't gotten our act together. We haven't even convinced the majority of Hindus that Hindu Desha exists, right? We're talking about in the chat, should we even call it this? What is it? It exists in this complicated and nefarious way. In this webinar, your word of mouth is another step in changing that narrative, and I'm happy and proud to be a part of it. So I'm sharing uh, an experience that I had as a teacher in a New York City high school. My student, uh, this student was mixed of, uh, I suspect, a Hindu background, uh, definitely Indian and African. And she says to me, I don't like you because you are a Hindu. My mom says you Hindus are devil worshippers. So my response was, I'm sorry you feel that way. I think we should speak with the guidance counselor on this. Now I put my little emoji there. I was not angry because I'm the adult in this situation. I felt deep pain and deep sorrow and deep sympathy for this child that I was looking at and could see how she, her mind was, was torted, you know, uh, with religion. Uh, she, she'd come from a Pentecostal background and uh, I had the dad come in and the dad was so embarrassed. He's like, I never taught you this. The, the mom and the dad had split. So she, I never taught you this. And here was the child, you know, with, with a, a different kind of, um, of mindset. And we all come from the Caribbean, mind you. And then this other kid of mine, uh, he is mixed. He was like Rastafari. And I suspect his mom was Christian. He says to him, Miss, are you Kuli? And I was like, yes. You remember what that means in Trinidad, right? Now, the word Kuli in Trinidad is a derogatory term, as you would say the N-word in America. For us, it's a, it's a deeply um, a problematic term. But over the years, just like, just like an in-group would use the N-word for themselves, I learned that when I came teaching and the kids would use the N-word and I was like, no, you can't say that. Miss, we can say that to ourselves. Other people can't say that to us. 
you know, and, and in Trinidad, it was the same thing because we can use this word and we even use it now in Trinidad, really. Both we can use if we are of the in-group, then you don't feel any kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, that negative feeling. So this kind of showed me here, I was the adult and these were kids who could so openly demonstrate a level of dwesha of, of, of their teacher's um, identity. You know, that, that, that was very troubling. But like I said, I did not feel anger because I was a teacher, but I have been subject to, to this in the adult world. And I've dealt with it as I've told my colleagues here at, at Hindu University of America, I've learned to be a bully over the years. That if you bully me, I bully you right back. And I've stood my ground. This video is part of a webinar series on Hindu Dvesha, an educational series to explore and expose systemic Hindu phobia. You might be wondering why we've been dredging this old history uh, on the roots of Hindu Dvesha. Uh, the reason is uh, we are constantly being asked why Hindus are are the objects of uh, this this hateful narrative in this world, whereas other minority communities are not. And uh, we felt it is important for us to uh, remind ourselves uh, how it got started and how it got translated into uh, the modern day experience, which basically is really a transformation of the same narrative uh, into today's world. So uh, I have a leading question here. You know, how do you tame an elephant? And you see this elephant being tied to a very uh, tiny, uh, through a tiny rope, to a very uh, flimsy uh, stake. Obviously, the only way you can control this uh, big beast is by messing up with his mind. By making him believe somehow that he is powerless. He has no options. He is nothing, no better than a sheep. And that is, I think, what has uh, happened to uh, Hindu community at large. So, uh, you know, Hindu mind could not have been an easy target for subjugation. When you look at the, the level of education that actually existed in India, and this is, this, this is coming actually from British colonial records, because a uh, lot, of, lot of Indians and Hindus don't, don't tend to believe what, you know, our own statistics. So I thought we'll dredge up actual British colonial records. They talk about, they state the mass education in early 1800s was actually more advanced and widespread in India than in England. On a number of axes, number of schools, number of students, duration uh, in school, quality of teachers, and so on and so forth. And here is actually a report that you can Google for yourself that uh, from 1838 that talks about how many schools existed in just the two states, Bengal and Bihar in 1830s, over 100,000 schools. Okay, so, you know, here's a highly, you know, educated population, uh, you know, sophisticated mind with a very sophisticated social structure. It must have been difficult, a very monumental task for them to actually subjugate our minds. Uh, but obviously it did happen. They did, did manage to subjugate us. They did manage to subjugate our minds. Uh, you know, this circular attack that, that kept on year after year after year with the full force of colonial government behind it uh, did manage to accomplish its objective, which was the pervasive colonization of, of our minds. And the impact on Hindu society is nothing but inferiority complex, alienation from our traditions, whether it's in terms of uh, food habits, whether it's in dress, whether it's how we speak to each other, uh, social norms, it affected all that. Uh, and of course, we became fascinated with colonizers' lifestyle and values. We want to adopt them, we want to shed ours. And the emergence of the special class of people who were actually colonized, but they acted like colonizers. You know, they call themselves, you know, we, I guess many of us are part of that, uh, you know, modern, liberal, secular, uh, global citizen, uh, Hindus in name only, or 
not spiritual but not not religious and so on and so forth now this colonial narrative continues to live beyond the colonial era uh, into the modern day as professor kundan singh has pointed out and that is the genesis of modern day attitudes was hindus or hinduism however that said they, we are able to break the shackles of this colonized mind at least in parts at least some of us and they become shining examples for us i'm showing here three examples from the recent history lieutenant colonel uh, kamal ji singh kalsi he fought very hard against the us uh, army to let him serve in the us army uh, while wearing his uh, full sikh gear uh, turban and full beard he ultimately won and uh, you know he's currently proudly serving in the in the uh, medical corps uh, dr swati mohan has been talked about in the chat room quite a bit uh you know i kind of feel bad for her because uh, her real accomplishment is actually landing the the rover on mars uh, but unfortunately he's standing more for the fact that you know she is wearing a hindu symbol uh in in a professional workspace which is great as well but you know let's also cheer her for the fact that she accomplished a major engineering feat I came across Roma Gujarati I held a uh, conference in Boston last year sorry in 2019 uh she was one of my panelists and uh, she gave a talk on her, her lifestyle choices and she told the audience that uh, she very early on she decided to wear bindi every day to school in spite of getting a lot of uh, bad looks from her friends and uh, criticism and now she's in Boston College of Law and she continues to follow that and i really like the quote very pithy quote she made she said simply put i look different because i am different and why should i be ashamed of that i think we can give uh, three cheers to these uh, these shining examples you know who are able to stand up take take a stand and uh, you know show their uh, their identity in professional uh, work spaces so uh, just sharing uh, some some personal thoughts on how we might be able to counter hindu dwesha this you know first of all let me let me point out that no one has a silver bullet you know this is not something that uh, uh you know we can make a list of you know a, a make a playbook or a list of 10 things we could do and and uh, you know make it disappear the other thing is uh, uh last time we actually got a question from someone say yes we know hindu dwesha exists so what is being done about it now that really you know uh, got my back up because um, you know it is not something that you can outsource source to someone else the fight has to be personal everyone has to be a foot soldier in this fight okay uh so that's that's one thing we have to ditch once and for all the idea that this is someone else's fight uh we can give it to this organization or that organization to fight everyone has to be part of this uh you know this this struggle the other thing is you really can't fight yeah i mean i can i can tell you go right to uh, you know uh, yeah go right letters to uh, editors of newspapers do this and that but unless we educate ourselves on some basic facts we really can't do it i mean we just you know emotions alone are not going to win this war uh, this has to be won with arguments i mean we truth is on 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 our side but we know, we need to know what the truth is we need to know some relevant historical facts we need need to know some of the key players and what they said uh we can achieve this through webinars like this um there are a number of beautiful courses that hua offers the hindu university of america offers that can give you a good perspective on on these issues of course there's always self study but we have to educate ourselves we have to arm ourselves with some basic facts before we can go out in the public square and and uh, put our views in a cogent fashion the other point i like to make is taking a page from the three examples i shared in the last page let's integrate at least one hindu symbol into our public life and i'm suggesting om now you know just wearing om around your neck is not going to uh, make hindu dwesha disappear but it creates a coherence in the hindu community you know you identify yourself as a soldier in this fight and it maybe it creates a dialogue you know if if cross or star of david and all these other symbols including hijab can be accepted in the workplace why not on 
Finally, we have a number of projects. I think monitoring the, the news media and various other communication channels and then writing reports on them on a quarterly or monthly, I mean, a yearly basis is a great way to daylight the kind of Hindu Dvesha that these, these organizations are uh, practicing. You can volunteer through the, through the chat room. Uh, we'll you know, so connect with you. On April 13, 1699, Guru Gobind Singh stood up in front of a large audience and said, he needs people who would want to sacrifice themselves for saving the dharma. And he got five volunteers. Those five volunteers ultimately, I mean, they changed the, the uh, course of history in India. If we could get five volunteers here who could join us in, uh, in some of the projects that we have, I think we would be miles ahead.